Judges chapter number 17 and verse number 6 to start. And we're going to be looking at a, this is going to be a, a message that's going to span this week and next week. So they're going to go together. I mean, the series kind of goes together, but this message in particular is going to going to cover two weeks because it's just too much to do in one one evening. Um, but Judges 17 and verse number 6. Judges 17, 6. We'll give a moment there, and then we're going to turn to Judges 21 and verse 25, which says something very similar. But Judges 17 and verse 6, the Bible says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Hey, in those days there was no king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now if you look over in chapter 21 in the last verse of the book of Judges, it says pretty much the same thing. Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That would be nice if it ended with, every man did that which was right. <laughs> that would be wonderful. But it doesn't. Okay? It says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now tonight, we're going to start moving towards more of an answer to our, our questions that we asked at the very beginning of the series and talk about the responsibility of human government. And this is going to be two parts because next week is going to be our responsibility to our government. So we have the responsibility of human government and then our responsibility toward our government. Um, so let's pray, and then we'll get into the message. Father, again, we come to you tonight, and be just very grateful, Lord, for the, the Bible and the scriptures. And Lord, I'm thankful that you have not left us without a witness of who you are in the creation as we look around and see what you've created. It is a witness of who you are and what you have done for us, but also, Lord, that you have revealed so much of us, so much to us in your word and given us an insight that that, 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 that moves back the curtain that is, is held in place by our physical eyes and allows us to see so much more through your word than we could ever see with our own eyes and could ever be witnessed of you in the creation. And Lord, I pray as, you give us, as, you, as you've given us this revelation of who you are, that you give us good understanding of your word, that we may understand you and understand what your work has been and what it means to us today as we look around in, in, in at our place in this world. Lord, as we're here in this day and in this time, help us to see how your word applies to us today. Lord, thank you so much for it. We ask your blessing upon it now. In Christ's name, amen. So as I was preparing this, got a little bit too big, so we're going to break it up tonight and talk about the responsibility of human government. Now let's just do a quick, uh, quick, quick review of the last two weeks. Very quick. We began with a look at authority in general. What authority is, where it comes from. Authority, the Bible tells us, of powers that be are ordained of God. All authority exists because God exists. There is no authority. We cannot understand authority in the world without understanding the fact that there is a God and that God is the author of everything. Without God, authority just has itself, and that's it. Without God, authority is the ultimate power in the world. And whoever has the might makes the right. But we understand, though, what, God, what, what authority is because we know about God and who God is. And we saw there are two types of authority. Uh, inherent authority, that is, and, and delegated authority. Inherent authority, the right that one has of ownership because they created something or, or authored it, if you will, and delegated authority is the right that someone has been given to fulfill a responsibility. Inherent authority is based on ownership. Somebody owns something, they have inherent authority over it. Now they can transfer that to someone else. I can take what I have and I can sell it to you or give it to you or trade it to you. And when I do, I'm giving you ownership and now you have authority. If I start a business and I don't want to run it anymore, Colonel Sanders started Kentucky Fried Chicken, then he sold the freight, sold it off. You know, that's what you do. And somebody else gets the right to it, and they can do what they want with it. 
because it's now theirs and they have the ownership over it. Um, but that's where inherent authority comes from. It comes from the creation or authoring of something and then it's the right of ownership which can be transferred to someone else. Delegated authority is based on responsibility. We talked about that at length last week. Delegated authority exists when someone has been given a responsibility to fulfill. A good example of that is someone who, who, who hires a babysitter. You say, the parents have responsibility for their children, so they have authority over their children. If you hire a babysitter, you're transferring some authority to them because they have some responsibility for your children. Now, their authority is not the same as yours. They don't have complete authority, but they have some authority because of their responsibility. Okay? If the parent says, okay, here's what time my child needs to be in bed, here's what they're allowed to eat, this is what they're allowed to have for snack, uh, this is what they're allowed to watch on TV, and then they leave, the babysitter's authority revolves around that responsibility. Now, if they decide to do something else, then they have to answer to the parent for what they did. They have to answer to their parent regardless, but if they do something else, they can expect they're not going to be babysitting again because they did not fulfill the responsibility correctly. So delegated authority revolves around responsibility. We saw that last week uh, with the man who was the centurion who said, I am a man with authority having authority over me. He said, I, I am responsible. He said, I have to answer. That's where, that's where delegated authority comes from, that responsibility. I have to answer. I've got a hundred men who are my soldiers, and I have to answer to somebody for those hundred men. So because of that, I have authority over them. And then there's a guy I got to answer to, too. And that's where delegated, that's a good example of delegated authority. Now tonight, we're going to take this concept of authority and look at what the Bible says about human government. Because we're talking about civil disobedience. And we have to understand the construct of human government to understand what it is we're allowed to do as Christians. When it comes to human government, especially as it's thought of in the Western world, or the Western way of thinking, government has often been described in terms that are not very flattering, or not very positive. It has been said, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Like a fire, it's a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Never for a moment should it be left to irresponsible action. That's been attributed to George, General uh, George Washington, or President Washington now, although no one's ever been able to find where he's actually said that. But government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, a dangerous servant, and a fearful master. James Madison, who wrote the Federalist Papers, along with two others who wrote the Federalist Papers, he wrote this. In the Federalist 51, he wrote, If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, you must oblige it to control itself. Man, think about it. If men were angels, we wouldn't have a need of government. Like we read here. Every man did that which was right. That'd be wonderful. The problem is, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And therefore, government is a necessity of life. Thomas Paine, who wrote the book Common Sense and wrote under the name Common Sense, wrote this. He wrote, Society is produced by our wants, government by our wickedness. Society promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections, but government negatively by restraining our vices. Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even at its, at its best state, is a necessary evil. Government has been looked at somewhat negatively, not very flatteringly, in the eyes of those who founded our country, which is one reason why we have the type of government we have that's divided up the power amongst many so that not one person rules 
over everyone. But as we consider government tonight, we are obliged to see what the Bible has to say about human government, where it comes from, why it exists. So let's start with the definition, and then we'll look at what the Bible says here. Definition of human government is simply this. Human government is a construct of a society whereby a person or a group of people have been given authority to make laws and enforce punishment upon those who break the law. Human government is a construct of a society whereby a person or a group of people has been granted authority to make laws and then enforce the punishment upon those who break the law. That's what we read. Well, that's what we read in, first, in Romans 13, and we'll look at that a little bit later in 1 Peter chapter 2. Both passages tell us that those who rule over us are to be a terror to evil works to punish those that do evil and praise those that do well. That is how the Bible frames human government. But as we look at the Bible, a lot of questions come up. Questions like, where does the right to govern people come from? Where does it come from? I mean, God, when he created Adam and Eve, he did not create government at that point in history. Adam and Eve were not constrained by any man's law or any ruler at all. How do we decide who has power and who does not have power in a society? Is governmental authority just because it exists? I mean, is it just right because government exists? Or is there some other measure of what makes government authority right and just and good? What do we as Christians do when a system of government limits the freedom of individuals? And what should we do when we disagree with what government does? So as we go through the next couple of weeks here, we're going to be answering these questions and understanding our responsibility. But let's start with government, where it comes from and what its responsibility is according to the Bible. Where does the right to govern people derive? Where did it start? Well, to answer that question, let's go back to Genesis chapter number 6. So we're going to use our Bibles a bit tonight, so we're going to keep them handy here. Genesis chapter 6. Verses 5 to 13. We know that government did not always exist. <clears throat> Where did it come from? Some would say it's an evolutionary step in man's development. But the Bible teaches something very different. The Bible tells us where government came from. Look here in Genesis chapter 6. We'll begin reading in verse 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great, in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, this is the lead up to the great deluge, the flood, okay? Every man, the Bible tells us, was living in wickedness and violence at the exception of Noah and his family. Noah walked with God. Noah was a righteous and a just man and the only one on the earth that was like that because he walked with God. Now, the reason why this happened in Genesis chapter 6 is because of what we read in Judges that tells us what happens when there is no authority on the earth. Before this time, there was no governmental authority. When God made man in the Garden of Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve. Adam sinned, and from that point on, you start to see a decline in man's morality. 
from Adam's sin to this point in history. But what you do not see is you do not see government. There was no government. There was no body that was put in place to punish those that do wrong. And because there was no one there to punish those that do wrong, man's sin had led him to where the whole earth was filled with violence and destruction. Ecclesiastes tells us if justice is not done or punishment is not meted out on, a, on crimes of society quickly, then the hearts of people turn against what is right. You've probably seen it in some of the social structures you've been in. If you see parents who do not punish their children when their children do wrong, you can watch over time and see where their children end up a lot of the time if they do not find God. They continue down a pathway. If you're in a classroom and you see that a teacher does not take control of an unruly situation in the classroom over the course of a school year, the classroom devolves into more and more unruliness because it's never dealt with. In a work situation, if somebody breaks the rules at work, and the boss, here's the thing, the boss knows and never does anything about it, it encourages others to do the same thing. Why does that happen? Because the heart of man is wicked and sinful. And so without restraint, without some force to restrain sin, man moves into violence and corruption. That is the tendency of man. Even in the most backwoods nation in the world, even in the most remote tribal nation in the world, some form of punishment for wrong exists. It's a sin against the tribe. Maybe somebody does something against the group, but there is some either excommunication or some form of punishment because any construct of society must do that for to have a civilized society. It must. So because there was nothing like that before the flood, as we read in Judges, when there's nobody in charge, everyone does what they believe is right. But that doesn't mean they're doing what is moral. And since the heart of man is corrupt, what we believe is right is not always right. So God sends a flood. He destroys the entire earth because of man's corruption, saving one man and his family because Noah walked with God. Now let's turn over to Genesis chapter 9. Because Genesis chapter 9 is where this idea of government enters into the picture. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 9 verses 1 through 6 begins to tell us where, tells us actually where... This idea of government came from. Genesis chapter 9. It is not a social construct that came out of man's evolutionary process. It is, comes directly from God. Look here in Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons. This is after the flood, after everything has calmed down again. Noah is now off the ark. It says, And said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, given even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh which, with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Those verses 5 and 6. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. This is the point where God stepped in and said, You need to take care of the problems that rise up in your world. God said this to Noah. He said, You're coming off the ark. This is what you're going to do. You're going to restart. Everything's been destroyed. Everything's been wiped out. The violence and corruption was so great, I had to destroy everybody. Now, it's your responsibility. When somebody commits a murder, when somebody takes the life of someone else, it is your responsibility 
to take their life and make it right. And in so doing, God instituted a start of a system that would punish people for their wrongdoing. This is very different than what happened before the flood. What happened when Cain killed his brother? God didn't require Cain's death. In fact, he did the opposite. When Cain killed Abel, it, Cain, God, God said to Cain, he said, uh, he, he said, you've killed your brother. He said, but if, you know, he said, sin's at the door. And he said, if you aren't going to repent, he said, if not, you're going to be a vagabond the rest of your life and you're going to live outside of the society. You're not going to be able to accept it in society. And Cain said, my sin is too much for me to bear. Everybody's going to kill me. God said, no, 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 I'll put a mark on you so no one will kill you. Isn't that weird? But there was no government yet. When Laman killed a man, he said, he said, Cain killed a man, and God said, no one's supposed to touch Cain, and God will avenge for Cain. He said, I killed a man. If God will avenge for Cain, he'll avenge me seven times more. And we see this slide into violence. But there was no government yet. Now God says, it is your responsibility to right what has been made wrong in the world. And by doing that, God is instituting the first law that man has to be responsible for. In the Garden of Eden, it was Adam and Eve's personal responsibility to obey God. At this point, God is now making it man's responsibility to enforce this regulation. Human government is given to us as a responsibility by God to punish those in a society that have done wrong against that society. It's a responsibility of God. It is a delegated authority that's given out to us. If we look back at Romans 13, let's do that real quickly. We've got to look at a few more verses tonight in the time we have. Romans chapter 13. And God talks about human government. He refers to it over and over as the same thing. Romans chapter number 13. And look at here at verse number 3, 4, 5, and 6. When God talks about human government. He talks about it the same way. Look here in Romans uh, chapter 13, verse Four, he, uh, verse uh, 3, it says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if do thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore he must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Over and over they are called the ministers of God. What he's saying is God is the one that put this in place. God didn't give them the form of government. He just said, do it. Take control. Punish evil. As a society, punish evil. And when you do that, you're acting as the minister of God when you're in that position to do that. That means something. It really does. But before we get into what it means, look what it says here over and over. The purpose of government is that punish evil. Now, why is that important? It says it in verse number three. He is not a terror to the good works, but to the evil. It says in verse number four that he beareth not the sword in vain. He is a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Over and over. This government is for the punishment of evildoers. But why? Well, let me show you. Look over at 1 Timothy chapter 2. And it kind of explains there why government is supposed to act in such a manner. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Well, that's, that was in Thessalonians. That isn't going to work. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I looked down and thought, that's not the right verse. That's the wrong book. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, 
for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That is the reason. Why does God want government to avenge, or why does God want us to take out wrath upon those that do wrong and punish the evildoers? It's so that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all honesty. It is the punishment of evil that is the deterrent to doing wrong. Government cannot make people love like we're supposed to. Romans 13, and we're going to see this in the coming weeks as we talk about a responsibility to government. Romans 13 tells us, love is the fulfilling of the law. Jesus told us all the law and the prophets are wrapped up in two ideas. Love the Lord your God. And love your neighbor as yourself. But the heart of man is so wicked that we fail in those areas. If we could do that, we wouldn't need government. Like James Madison said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But we're not. So in order to maintain peace in a society, we must punish those that do wrong. That is the responsibility of government. And as we said before, where authority begins and ends is where responsibility begins and ends. So the authority of government is to punish those that do wrong. So the responsibility of government begins and ends with the punishment of those that do wrong. No, it's not the government. God did not institute government to train our children to do right. He gave us a family and a parents to do that. God did not institute government to take the gospel to the world. God gave us a church to do that. God did not institute government to provide for our families. Each family is supposed to do that. But God did tell us, you must punish evil. That's what government is for. This thought was further, further uh, strengthened when Moses brought the people out of Egypt and came to Mount Sinai. What did God give them in Mount Sinai? He gave them a whole set of laws and said, here you go. Here's your society. And every time someone breaks the law, he said, I gave you a system too. He said, I gave you judges to go ahead and judge between what is right and wrong, and you're to punish those that do evil. Why? Because it deters people that we're going to do evil. Now, the greatest deterrent to doing evil is love, but if there's no love in our hearts, the second greatest deterrent to do evil is that sword that the government bears. You know, when I was, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, the greatest deterrent to do, or the, greatest in, the greatest motivator to do right and the greatest deterrent to do wrong was love of mommy and daddy. But when love of mommy and daddy wasn't good enough, you know what the greatest deterrent to doing wrong was? The belt that hung on the wall. Or the paddle that my mom kept in the drawer. Because I knew that if I disobeyed, there was a wooden spoon that had my name on it. If I didn't do what I was supposed to do, or if I disobeyed what I wasn't supposed to disobey, then I knew. My mom found out there's that paddle. The greatest motivator for driving the speed limit is either our conscience or it's the police car that's sitting on the side of the road. If you're in a line of traffic and there's a police car up the road, you see how many people's brake lights come on? <laughs> it's the truth. Because the threat of punishment for wrongdoing is a deterrent to keep people from doing wrong. It has been said you cannot legislate morality, and what they mean by that is you cannot write a law that will make you love, but you can write a law that can stop you from doing wrong, as long as the punishment is great enough. Turn with me over to another passage. Let's look over here at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Government has been given to us by God as a way to punish evildoers so that we can bring peace to our society. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, Kings and all that are in authority allow us to lead a quiet and peaceable life. Here, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Through verse 13. 
coming to a close, it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. What kind of good works is he talking about here? Well, let's continue to read. Verse 13, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well, for so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. There it is. So why, did God, why does God give us, or why, why do we have kings and governors and people in authority? For the punishment of evildoers and the praise of them that do well. They are sent, literally sent, for that purpose. Because they're the ministers of God. Let me end with this thought. Human government came into place because God told man, you have to deal with the unjust evil that's going on in your world. Starts with murder. Make that, at least deal with that. And then we brought Israel out. He said, here, let me give you a whole bunch of more laws that you're supposed to keep. And he gave them a whole set of laws. And in it, God, hey, God, you know, God in the laws of Israel affirmed uh, public pro or private property by telling Pope, folks, you're not allowed to steal. What's God saying? Hey, what you own is yours. And government should help you maintain what is yours. Don't steal. God affirmed the telling of truth by saying that you're not supposed to bear false witness against your neighbor. And if you do, and, and to bring about evil upon him and you're found out, government's supposed to do to you what you wanted to do to your neighbor. That's what they told the Israelites to do anyway. God was saying this is affirming the tr telling of truth in a society. God was affirming so many things of morality and then giving government the power to enforce that, those laws. Because that's what government was to do. But as such, the Bible says they are the ministers of God to thee for good. Let me say, government came from God as God, God, God thought up. He didn't tell us how to do it. He just told us to do it. He didn't say have a president. He didn't say that. He didn't say have a king. He didn't say that. He didn't say have a congress. He didn't say that. He just said take care of the issues. Okay? Government is there to help us live, lead a quiet and peaceable life. That's what it is for. By punishing of evil... We can lead a quiet and peaceable life ourselves because it deters those that would do wrong. And lastly, because of that, they are the ministers of God. Therefore, they have to answer to God for the power they have. Let's look at one last verse as our closing verse. Turn up our closing passage. Let's go back to the Old Testament to 2 Samuel real quickly. And we'll close with this passage tonight and just a thought on this passage. Because government has a responsibility that's God-given, those in government are going to have to answer to God for what they've done. They are. Every single one of them is. There was a time I, I thought about the fact of, of getting into politics, and when we were in New Hampshire, we were living out there, I kind of got caught up in all the political brouhaha. It's, you know, first in the nation primary and all the... When, I was, when we, were, we were living in West Virginia, we were living in, even here in Pennsylvania, it, it's nothing compared with the political climate that's in like New Hampshire. It's insane. I mean, there are signs up all the time, sometimes year round, just everywhere. And people are just, it's, it's in your face everywhere you go. Politics is so big. And I thought about one point actually running for office. Oh, this would be interesting to get involved. But once I saw that, Government officials are going to answer to God for what they do. I don't want to get anywhere near that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, thank you. <laughs> I, don't want, I got enough to answer for. I don't want to, have to answer for that too. Look here in 2 Samuel chapter 23, in verse 1 through 3. David's coming to the end of his life, and I want you to notice what David says here. It says in verse 1, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, 
The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. See that? David said, I was the king of Israel. I was the top man in Israel. You know, having a monarchy is a very efficient form of government. you got one guy making decisions. He doesn't have to wrangle with anybody. He can ask advice, but whatever he says goes, right? Solomon said, where the word of the king is, there is power. He can do whatever he wants. Now, I'm not saying I'm, I'm for that. I'm just saying that, that it is. David was at the top. And he said this, even though we and the man at the top, I know this much. As a ruler, I better be just. Because I got somebody I got to answer to. And that's God. And David kind of went his own way and did his own thing. God stepped in, corrected him in a very, very strong way. And David felt the lash of God's punishing hand upon him and his family. It fell apart. His family shattered him. He had children killing each other. I mean, his, his whole life fell apart because of his sin. But he had to answer to God. When Solomon was in power, and he was David's son and the wisest man who ever lived, the Bible tells us that in his old age, Solomon's heart departed from the Lord. And God sent judgment on the nation of Israel because Solomon's heart departed from God. And God tore the nation into a, almost into a civil war. He tore it apart because a man turned his heart against God. I think of Nebuchadnezzar, probably one of my favorite examples in the book of Daniel, of how God, those who in charge, they answer to God. And God, God, he's, he's keeping track. The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar, his heart was lifted up in pride. and God took his heart and turned him into a beast. And Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of the known world, the ruler of the world, was out in the field eating grass like a cow. Because God humbled the great king. Those who are in authority are God's ministers, not in the sense that whatever they do is right, but in the sense that they must answer to God someday for what they've done. They've been given a responsibility. And God's going to call them into account for what they've done with the responsibility that they had. So our government... <clears throat> Today is not a monarchy, the one in which we live under. We, we live under a republic and a representative democracy, if you will. God didn't tell us how to do it. He just told us to do it. He said, punish those that do evil. And those who are in authority have that responsibility to punish those that do evil. But you know, our governor, you've got a lot to answer for when he stands before God someday. And those that have used the office of president, be it for a few years, be it for eight years, However long they've been in office, they've got a lot to answer for. And those that have written laws that have been unjust, and those that have written laws that have taken the lives of little children before they were born, and those that have used this system to hurt others and enrich themselves have a lot to answer for. Because what they were given the responsibility to do was to punish those that do wrong. Now as we understand the responsibilities of human government, next week we're going to look at the Christian's responsibility to our government. Because that's when we start to understand when it's right for a Christian to stand up and say, I can't do that. So many times we have it in our hearts that we don't want to obey, but it's not because God tells us to, it's because we don't want to. There are times, though, and those times, maybe many more in the future, I think there probably will be, where we're going to have to stand up and say we can't do that. It's not right. So we're going to get into that next week. We're going to start that up next week. Our responsibility to government. Well, that's where it comes from. It comes from God. God put it in place to punish evildoers, and they have a responsibility to do that. They're going to answer to God for it someday.